We are the ashes, we are the fire, chapter 11. I'm sprawled on the couch when mom arrives with takeout, which is the first sign that something's off. Where's Poppy? Hello to you too, my darling daughter. She dumps the bag on the kitchen counter and stomps back to their bedroom. I get up to investigate the food. When mom wants me to know some. When mom wants me to know what's wrong, I'll know. Plus the smell of gorditos wafts from the bag. They have these burritos that are literally as big as a baby. The restaurant has photos on the wall of infants lying next to these monster burritos for comparison. We used to get a single burrito and split it four ways for the whole family. Inside the bag, I find three separately wrapped foil packages. When the door slams, I wonder if mom slipped out of her bedroom window to come around and make another pissy entrance. But this time it's Poppy who also has takeout bags. He doesn't slam them on the counter like mom, though. He stands frozen, staring at me in confusion. Is that for you? His chin points at the three burritos I'm putting onto plates. For all of us, I assume, mom brought them home. That unfreezes him. He drops the bag on the counter and stomps off to their bedroom. There's no way to avoid their rising voices in our tiny house. Plus, I'm kind of curious. I can count on one hand the number of times I've heard them yell at each other. Poppy's bags contain Korean. I'm transferring the food to bowls. I said I'd get dinner, Poppy says. You said you wouldn't have time to make it and that I'd pick something up. You were being sarcastic. Why would I be sarcastic about that? I whistle at Chester to follow me so he doesn't sneak any food off the table and we march to their bedroom. I knock on the door but op- I knock on the door but open it without waiting for a response. They both turn to me in shock. Jess is coming over in 20 minutes, I inform them. Their parents have actual reasons to scream at each other in bedrooms, given the bitter divorce and all. So they get enough of whatever this is. There's an abundant multicultural feast getting cold on the table. So whatever this is, maybe it can wait. With that, I return to the table where I start serving myself. And this could go any number of ways. We're all sort of spelunking without a headlamp in here. After a shock silence, they both explode in laughter and I breathe a sigh of relief. They give explanations for their stork tempers over dinner, even though the real explanation is we're all fried down to the last wire and could spark at any moment. They ask questions about Jess's home life, and I remind them of Jess's pronouns when they mess up. Poppy ponders how to handle non-binary pronouns in Spanish, which is so heavily gendered. By the time Jess arrives, my parents are are cleaning the kitchen together, talking about taking a salsa class at the community center. You're so lucky. Jess props their feet. On the up on the railing along the back porch. It's that time of year when evenings stretch further and further, and sometimes it seems like darkness will never fall. But it always eventually does. I know what they mean, so I don't say something snarky. I am lucky in so many ways. I breathe in the last blooms on the neighbor's lilac tree while Jess pencil st- scratches across along a sketch pad. Can I see? Not yet. Chester perks up at the sound of a siren in the distance, but decides it's not worth his while and settles back down at Jess's feet. When we were little, any time we heard a siren, Nora and I used to stop whatever we were doing, no matter what, and turn to each other, clasp both hands, and say, fire, sickness, horror, flood, sisters always heart and blood. I have no idea where it came from. Some creepy fairy tale, probably. Has your dad moved out yet? I asked Jess. Instead of answering, they hold up the sketch pad. They've drawn an amazingly intricate sword, the hilt engraved with curtails and letters that I can't read, the blade somehow catching the light, even though it's in a sketch pad, it's sketch padded in pencil. That's gorgeous. It's meant to be terrifying. Well, yeah, if it was pointed at my neck, it would be less gorgeous. On the table between us, just as phone buzzes, they glance at a text, grimace. Can I spend the night here? When I don't answer right away, they add, I don't have to if it's weird. It just sounds like they're still at it. The relief I feel at the idea of a late night whispers, a person who'd wake if I wake, rushes in so fast it floods me with guilt. Jess is not a replacement for Nor. Of course you can. I leave the notebook I've been holding like a shield on the table and go inside to pull out some extra blankets and arrange the hide-a-bed in the living room. I half expect Jess to follow me in and chatter up a storm while I make up a bed. But for once, they stay still and quiet, alone, except for Chester and the distant sirens. Fire, sickness, horror, flood. Once I'm done, I make hot cocoa and fill my parents in. They're all sad, concerned faces, but at least they don't go out to the patio to smother Jess with loving kindness. When I get out there with two mugs of cocoa, Jess's pencil is back 
to scratching away. Another sword, I ask, setting the cocoa down. I see. Then I see that they're not drawing on their sketch pad. The writing in my notebook. Coco slashes across the table, splattering Jess's abandoned sketch pad as I grab Marguerite from their hands. What the hell? What? You can't write in someone else's journal. And you can't pour coffee all over someone's sketch pad. That was an accident. And it's hot cocoa. The ridiculous of the distinction dampens my fury, but only a little. This is private. You've been asking for my help on every little thing. What kind of sword? What's the castle layout? Clothing? Armor? Where did... Where'd they take a shit? I take a careful breath. Notice my parents watching us from inside. That still doesn't make it okay for you to write in my book. They nod. Okay, you're right. I'm sorry. I should have asked, but I didn't write. I drew. That doesn't make it better, but it does make me curious. I open the notebook and flip through until I find the page that contains not only my sprawling handwriting, but also a striking medieval sword over an intricate flower tapestry, ripped and jagged at the bottom edge. But... It's also this incredibly beautiful piece of miniature art. I glance up. Jess watches carefully, more vulnerable than I've ever seen them. It's beautiful. They let out a breath. I was thinking about illuminating, illuminated manuscript. Do you know? I shake my head and sit where while Jess pulls up some images on their phone. I'm looking at the ordinate pages from a book, really old manuscripts from way before the printing press. The words look like calligraphy, but... What's notable about the pages that are the intricate borders, miniature illustrations, and gorgeous lettering beginning each page. Illuminated because they always had some gold leaf involved. Jess says, reaching over to scroll through and point out a favorite. They look religious. A lot are. Ordinarily, monks made them. Like, they were monks whose whole job was making these beautiful works of art. But by Marguerite's time, they weren't only religious books became a status symbol. They were super expensive because of all the labor. And the gold leaf? Right. They sort of fell out of fashion when the printing press came along, but that was after Marguerite. I scroll through some more of the photos. They're absolutely stunning. I'm not really a fine arts person, but I can't stop looking at these. All the details, all the time poured into them. Books are status symbols, stories, valued so much they're cast in gold. Marguerite's story is worth illuminating, Jess says carefully. Yeah, it is. Flay. The crack of a twig alerts the doe. She's no longer safe at the stream. A man shouts, propels me to my feet. Some dive for shelter while Betsy wields her knife. One of the new girls grabs a broom. I grasp her something, anything, but this is not an armory and there's no time. A man bursts through the door. A surge of fury sends me lunging, clawing at his face, but Betsy yanks me back. Master Philippe. My brother's wild eyes and his desperation are blunt edges. Blunt edged reminders of our parents have been slaughtered and Helen. He barely sees me hell bent on the only survivor who matters. I haven't, couldn't, but my brother's voice tears a sob from my gut, the crescendo of a kneeling whale that s- started the moment the first dragon breathed its all-consuming fire. I've never cried as a child. When he cut, when he cut off my braid, stole my sword, bested me in race, my cries pierce his armor, brings him to his knees as well. I thought she'd stayed alive until I found her, blessed her, but waded through the massacre, has erased all doubts. Helen is dead. Philippe sees, but doesn't the women all around us stripped to their cores and nothing left but horror. He asked after mother, Papa, if either lived, all eyes wouldn't turn toward them. Helen is dead. I don't realize how desperately I longed for embrace until he reaches out, but only yanks me to a corner. You must take these women. Go immediately to the sisters at Salit. One day's ride to the south. You'll be taken care of there. I cannot stay in this fortress of horrors, but neither can I set out on the open road. The both prospects terrify me in equal measure. What life awaits me in a convent? What death awaits me in the world? And what of you? Me? There's Philip, I know, looking at his kid sister as though she were ridiculous. I'm going to find these bastards and flay them open end to end. 
before I can argue he's gone. I'm left with the task of shepherding these women injured, traumatized into the mountains, but they'll be safe there. We aren't safe now. Even if the monsters don't return, the life we knew here has been drowned in blood.